First of all, I want to say congratulations to Quinlan, Zofia, Vincent, and Moses, who are receiving their first communion today. And many thanks to Caroline and Andy, who um, got them ready for this today. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Love, the word love, is one of the most overused words in our culture today. We use it to talk about our family. I love my wife. We use it to talk about our religion. I love God. But we also use it to talk about our food and our pets. Like, I love coffee, and I love my parrot. The Beatles said, all you need is love. The hippies said, make love, not war. And today, the word love can mean just about anything. And, any, and when a word can mean anything, it actually means nothing at all. Therefore, we need to return to an earlier traditional Christian understanding of the word love. And Christian culture derives its understanding of the word love from the Bible, especially from the passion story. On the night before his passion, Jesus put on the apron of a slave and washed the feet of his disciples. He even washed the feet of Judas, the traitor who would betray him. And then he said to them, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In a homily on this verse, St. Augustine asked, in what sense is this a new commandment? Didn't the Mosaic law teach the same thing? Love your neighbor as yourself? And then Augustine answered his own question. He said, quote, the key is this, as I've loved you, you are also to love one another. Close quote. See, our model for love is Jesus. In the Christian mind, love looks like Jesus. And at the cross, Jesus lived out his love with courage, with self-sacrifice, and with faithfulness, even unto death. And that's the Christian understanding of love. And it's an understanding that is mature, that it's, it's specific, it's robust, and it's fearless. And what sets this understanding of love apart from the squishy, hallmark kind of love is that understood properly, love does not originate in us at all, but in God himself. St. John, who we also heard from this morning in his first epistle says this. He says, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love, and in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be an expiation for our sins. See, we love, we love because God first loved us. That is what makes Christian love different. It originates in God, and therefore it doesn't rely on us in any way. It doesn't rely on our fickle hearts and our weakness um, and our ability to follow through. It relies instead on God and his enduring strength. And there are two implications for this. First, it means that Christian love is not a feeling, but a choice. Christian love is not a feeling, but a choice. 
We don't wait around until we feel like we're in the mood before we obey Jesus and read out and reach out in Christian love. There are times for all of us in every important relationship we have, whether it be a, with a spouse or a sibling or with a parent or with a business partner or even with a good friend, there are times when we don't feel particularly loving or affectionate or even like the person we're dealing with at that moment. And at these times, Christian love is an act of will. It's an act to choose to love in that moment because that's what Jesus did and that's what he calls us to do. It's our duty. And this is a tremendous act of fidelity to God and to one another. But it's a powerful witness to the world of love and what Christian love looks like. I will never forget when I heard a testimony of an Arab man who had converted to Christianity. And he said that what converted him was the Sermon on the Mount. Specifically, um, Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus said this, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. This man in his testimonial said that as he grew up in a very conservative Arab culture, he learned from an early age, who do you love? You love your family, you love your kin, you love your community, but not your enemy. You hate your enemy. And it was not until he read the Christian Bible that he had even heard of anyone say, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. But it's, uh, it, it's one of the revolutionary ideas that Jesus taught. And we, we forget that. We take for granted because we grew up in this culture and we, we've heard it since we were kids growing up. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And as hard as it sounds to us, we sort of take it for granted and we don't realize how revolutionary in terms of world ideas that it really is. And this idea was, uh, was converted him at great risk and a great sacrifice, by the way. And what drew him to Christ was this distinctively Christian love, love that looks like Jesus. So that's the first implication of, of Christian love. It's not a feeling, and it doesn't come from us at all. It comes from God, and it's a choice. It's a choice. The second implication is that if our model for love is Jesus, then we need to imitate Jesus. All of us, by virtue of our Catholic faith, are called to holiness. And holiness means we conform ourselves to Jesus and not to the world. Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and, accept and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual wor worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and, and perfect. And in fact, you can, you can interpret that as Paul saying that in order even to understand what is the will of God, first you have to conform to the will of God and, and rather and, and not and transform to the will of God and not conform to the world. Being Christian is countercultural. It always has been. It always will be. When Jesus was presented in the temple, Simeon said to Mary, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and a sign that is spoken against, that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. From the very beginning, um, it, it, Jesus was prophesied to cause division, to cause discernment, to cause a, 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 a great divide. 
And that's not a bad thing. That's part of what he came to do. In dark times like the ones we're in today, remember that Simeon's prophecy was in, is in, happened in the Roman world, which is a very dark time. And that prophecy of Jesus being... Um, coming for the fall and rising of many make complete sense. Well, we are in another dark time like that. We're living in a world like that, that's dark. And and such a world hates to be challenged. In fact, in fact, uh, our gospel reading this morning ended at um, verse 17. But if you continue at the very next verse, at the very next verse, so it's, it's connected to the passage we heard. At the very next, next, next verse, uh, Jesus said this, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The point is that Jesus and, and us, and being his followers, can't, we need to look different from the world. We can't go along to get along with the world. So what does lo- love look like? It looks like Jesus. And the love that looks like Jesus is truly revolutionary. To love one another as Jesus loved us. To lay down our lives for our friends. And, and, and this, this Christian love, unlike the Hallmark variety, it's beautiful, it's heroic, it's what motivated the saints. And we can expect that the world will reject it and push back against it. But God, but it comes from God, and God will give us the grace to live, to live it out boldly and to live this kind of love. It's a supernatural love, not a natural one, and we cannot achieve it in our own strength because it comes from God and it leads to God, but God gives us the grace to do it. Remember, it's not a feeling, it's a choice, and we can only attain it with the help of the Holy Spirit by God's grace. So St. John said, in this love, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And may God, in his grace, enable us to have a love such as this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.